Today we're going to be tearing down this Lexus 2GR engine to see what's inside and how it works. Now this is a 3.5 liter V6 engine that I swapped out of my Lexus ES350. Now by putting a boroscope in the spark plug tubes I found that the pistons and valves collided with each other so I know there's some kind of collateral damage going on in here. And given the huge oil leak on this side I would assume that it probably jumped timing due to a lack of oil from the timing chain tensioners. So let's tear this down to see what happened. Now the first thing we're going to do is remove the rear valve cover here. Now this bank actually faces the firewall and I think that's where the damages so I'm going to remove this valve cover first. We're going to first remove this hard line for the VVTi gear. Fuel bolt here. Filter looks pretty clogged and here's the line. Now this rubber piece here on this line was subjected to a recall because it would burst and the engine would lose oil pressure and supposedly stall. So make sure if you have a 2GR engine you swap this out for the full metal line. Next I'm going to pull out these VVTi solenoids. Now I actually have to be careful when I'm taking apart this engine because it's going back for a core charge and I have to pretty much rebuild it. But I'm going to keep these because I got the same engine in my Sienna. I'm keeping all these coils as well. Now I'm going to remove all the 10 millimeter bolts that go all the way around this valve cover. Always forget the middle ones there. The 12s here. I'm going to try not to break anything this time. Yeah, I broke it. Alrighty, it's so crispy. Alright, as you can see under the valve cover, things are pretty tarnished, which means that whoever took care of this didn't change their oil on time and caused the oil to break down a lot. There's also no excessive wear or anything on the camshafts indicating a low oil situation. The timing chains so far look like they're intact. Now I'm going to move to the front bank over here. Now this one did not show any signs of piston to valve damage. I'm going to remove the variable valve timing solenoids. Now I'm going to remove the tens that go all the way around. Now on the front we have the hard line for the VVTi, so I'm going to remove that 17. It's got a little filter in it which looks okay. And on the other side of that hard line there's another 17 that bolts to the block. So this front side is actually already a hard line. I can remove the valve cover. Holy, this one's even darker. Yeah, underneath the front valve cover it looks a little bit darker than the rear one. I was getting some compression on these cylinders and the boroscope didn't show any damage on the piston heads. Alright, so here in between the banks here we have the air intake and we have a plastic fuel rail here with a rubber that goes over to the other side. I don't really like the idea of plastic fuel rails because it could potentially crack and cause a fuel leak. This is a port injected engine only. Now the intake is held onto the two heads by 10 millimeter nuts and bolts. I'm going to go ahead and remove that. All right, we'll pop off the air intake here. Now it's really difficult to see, but the intake valves on this rear bank here are all wide open. But according to the timing on the camshaft, they shouldn't be, which means that they're pretty much bent at an angle and they're contacting the piston. Next up, I'm going to work on the water pump. Now one thing with these front wheel drive 2GR engines is that it's super tight because it's right up against the frame rail over here. In order to do a water pump job, the manual actually says to remove the engine, but some people have been able to get away with just lifting the engine up in order to get these bolts off. Check it out, this water pump was actually chewing up its seal. You could see the shreds of it over here. Alright, I'll just get this thermostat housing out of the way. Now there's a bunch of 10s and 12s that run all the way around this water pump, so I'm going to go ahead and remove those. You really got to keep track of which one goes where when doing a water pump job at one of these. Now I'm going to remove this water pump thermostat housing here. It doesn't seem very friendly like it wants to move. Bring that out of the way. And that's going to expose more water pump bolts up here. Now I'll remove all the 12s that go around here. Oh no! Oh my goodness! That uh, made a huge mess there. I got my brother's old jeans, it was kind of ripped up. I mean, summer's done anyway. Who needs jeans? Got that. I got my wife's old scarf here. She don't need that anymore. And then I found a piece of someone's t-shirt. That must have been mine. I'll just sap that up. This stuff is cheaper than pigment and you get to recycle um, somebody's clothes. That water pump was really on its way out. It's a very common problem on these 2GR engines and it's compounded by the fact that it's really hard to access in the car. Alright, I gotta get the crank bolt off. I got something jammed in the flywheel at the back. Let's see what get. Alright, I need the long bar. Yes! I like it, you don't need a puller for these. Looks like that harmonic balancer was grazing up against the timing housing here. You can see it's pretty shiny and clean. Next I'm going to remove the AC bracket which is actually part of the tensioner assembly here. These are 14 millimeter bolts. I was getting crank position sensor codes and that's where the crank position sensor lives behind the AC compressor and underneath the alternator which is pretty difficult to access on the car. Now in order to get this timing cover off we will need to remove the lower oil pan and the upper oil pan because there's bolts that go up and through here and there's an oil pump attached in there. So I'm going to have to turn the engine upside it down and work on the bottom. All this coolant. Okay, I'm just going to let it rip. 
But here you can see the bottom view of the 2GR engine. It has a stamped steel oil pan over here, which is leaking. And over here we do have an aluminum upper oil pan. Attached to that upper oil pan is the cartridge style oil filter, which I don't like because it makes so much mess when you got to remove it. And you have to use a special tool to get on here. And I'm going to go ahead and remove this. Now this housing here is actually made of metal. These are the more valuable ones because Toyota actually switched to a plastic design, which sometimes will crack on newer models. And let's take a look. You can see that oil filter. It does look dirty because it looks like this oil hasn't been changed in a while. But I don't see any particles inside of here or any signs of definite. Oh, look how crusty it is. Definitely hasn't been changed in a while. It's just falling apart on me here. All right, so I take that back. I can actually see there are a few particles inside of there, probably little metal shards. I came off of this filter. So there's definitely something going on inside of this engine. And this thing is just so brittle. Next up, I'm gonna remove the 10 millimeter bolts going all the way around the oil pan. Check out all the little particles inside of the pan there. That doesn't look good for this engine. All right, so check out the amount of particles sitting around the pickup tube here. They're actually not magnetic. They're not being picked up by this magnet. I wonder what this is made of. It feels kind of gritty. It doesn't feel like RTV or anything like that. Or maybe it is, but it's really, really gritty. Yeah, but it's not being picked up at all. Now the upper oil pan is held in by a bunch of 12 millimeter bolts going all the way around. All right, now I can remove that upper oil pan. Next I'm going to remove this oil dipstick tube. You check out all that gunk inside of there. Definitely had some points of oil starvation. Wouldn't be surprised if I saw that on the bearings. Next I'm going to remove this windage tray. Now taking a look at the bottom end of this GR engine, you can see we've got a typical V6 layout where we have four main caps here. There's six main bolts with four going down this way and they're also cross braced on both sides. There's no H-frame ladder securing anything down to make this a stronger engine. Now the overall condition of the oil inside of here is kind of gritty. There's a lot of little sludge particles and that gritty kind of buildup in here which indicates that the oil has broken down and it's absorbed a lot of dirt and deposits. Now the oil pickup too will actually feed oil down through the oil pump which is this assembly at the front here which is part of the timing cover and that's the reason why we had to move both the lower and upper oil pans so we can get these bolts out now this here is the oil outlet where it's going to go to that oil filter that used to sit over here all right so with that out of the way i can now flip the engine back over to work on it probably make another mess or so really heavy for a v6 <sighs> Good. Lots of mess on the ground. I heard they make a special drain pan for these engine stands. That'd be really nice to get if somebody wants to send me one. I think I'm gonna have to open my own clothing donation box because I'm running out. I got my baby's old sleeper here. I got the kitchen towel over here. I ain't got much left. All right, next up, we're gonna tackle this timing cover. It's a bunch of 10s, 12s, and probably some 14s. I'm just gonna work my way around and hope that I can get this thing back together, not knowing where all the bolts go. If you have to do this in the vehicle, there's no easy way. You just can't do it. All right, so now's where I get to see if I forgot any bolts. And we see here, this is the reason why you can't do it in the vehicle. There's not enough clearance to just take this off. It's just right up against the fender. Now, if I turn the engine where these two dots line up here on the front bank, you can see everything lines up properly. However, on the rear bank, which is the one that was affected, we've got one dot over here on the exhaust side, but there's nothing lining up on the intake gear. You have to turn that all the way to here to get that single mark. So definitely this gear is out of timing because the intake side was where we saw the valves that were damaged. However, if you take a closer look, you'll see that all of the bolts here are actually missing from this variable valve timing gear. There's supposed to be these security style fasteners and as to where they're gone, I'm not sure because the flakes that were inside the oil pan were non-magnetic and these bolts, well, they're supposed to be magnetic. So it's not like they sheared off and went down inside the oil pan somewhere. Now, if you remember my video on variable valve timing, you'll know that this cam phaser here actually uses oil pressure to rotate in order to phase the intake camshaft timing. And now, since these bolts here have sheared off completely, it's allowed to phase whatever direction it wants because there's no more control. And that's why the intake side of the camshaft has all bent valves because it's out of timing. However, the exhaust side, because it's in time with the crankshaft, did not experience much damage. Look at that. When this bolt backed out, it caused a lot of collateral damage over here. It bent up this plate over here. I think I've never really seen this failure before. Pretty interesting for a Toyota. All right, now I've got to remove the main timing chain. One from crank to the intake camshafts and then the intake camshaft to the exhaust camshaft on either side. Now the main one is held in by this tensioner over here. What the heck is this? I found this in the engine. I can take this off the sprocket here without dying. Here. Now these slides are a remix between plastic and backed with metal. At least it's not all plastic. I hate how the chain is so close to the other gear. You can't get it off. 
Whatever, we'll just leave that and take the head off right now. I want to see that damage. See if I can gun this off. With this broken, this camshaft has no input and it's just sitting there in this rest position. Which is why all the valves are bent downward, because the piston to valve damage. And which is why all the little rocker arms fell out when I turned this engine over. Whereas this side, we're still connected to that gear. See that? We're still connected to that gear because these bolts bolted together. Now if you wanted to know, you'll see that the bolt heads alone didn't just shear off. The bolt actually completely backed out. You can still see that there's threads in there where it would have been. There's no sheared off bolt. And you'll see that it was loose for some time. It was rattling around in there. You can see the threads there imprinted inside of this gear and they elongated themselves. And after a while, they just decided to completely back off. There's actually kind of a ladder frame cradle here that sits on top of the engine head. And that provides you a little cam cap. So it's all one piece. It's held in by a bunch of 12s and 10s. So I'm going to go ahead and remove those. Alright, so I lied, this actually isn't a full cradle, it's kind of a semi-circular cradle. And then at the top here you have the ones with the variable valve timing holes. These are all your cam cap. I don't see any indication of oil starvation though. I'm going to remove the camshafts together. Tensioner just dropped out there. This is also a hydraulic tensioner. So the bottom part of the camshaft has this cradle here, which houses the lower portion of the bearing. Now the bearing surfaces look to be in good condition. Now the head bolts on Toyotas are a 12 point bi hexagon bolt head. I'm going to just use a regular hexagon head, it's a 10 millimeter, and hopefully it'll get it out. So I think I stripped the bolt here and here, so I'm going to have to order the correct tool and come back another day. Alright, so while we wait for that over here on the front and back, I'm going to take out all the 10 mils to get the cam caps off. Now I'm going to get all the 12 millimeter bolts. I'm just going to pull off all these cam caps. Doesn't look oil starved, but there definitely was some debris running through the oil system. You can see there's definitely something that ran through the oil system causing these scars. They should be pretty polished. And we'll just take off that cam plate. And here you can see these are the hydraulic lifters. The lifters are inside of here and it uses oil pressure in order to press down so that there's no clearance between the camshaft and this little roller that's pressing down against the valve spring. So I just remove all this. We do have this crossover manifold where the heater hose hooks up to as well as the coolant temperature sensor and lower radiator hose. There's also a crossover tube that runs down the middle of the V-bank. I'll just remove all the 10 mils from it. This has been a couple days and I got the proper socket. It's a bi-hexagon 10 millimeter socket, which is the proper one for Toyota head bolts. It came all the way from the United States of America, so it's a couple days later. So I was able to actually knock those stripped head bolts free. So let's knock out the rest of them. Ah, oh, these are tight. All right, let's pull this head off. And as you expect with a broken camshaft, piston and valves are going to collide with each other and that's where you see these semicircles over here on each of the pistons. I was able to see this with the boroscope which is what determined that this engine was done for me because all the valves on the head are bent open. By the way, this is what you got to do to get your knock sensors and the wiring harness is pretty easily damaged and chewed up by rodents or whatever likes to live inside of the V of these engines. Lucky thing they made this part of the loom removable. Best way to clean your head bolts, a little bit of brake cleaner. <coughs> oh, that stuff tastes bad. And your wife's little toothbrush, and then just scrub it out of there. The socket is awesome, especially if you work on a lot of Toyotas. I'm going to leave an Amazon link in the description below if you want to check this out. Now this is different than an M12 triple square socket because of the shape of the points. Now even on the front bank, the compression wasn't very consistent, so let's see if we see anything underneath. Tight. Alrighty, let's peel this off. Taking a look at the front bank here. I do notice that these two here have a slightly less carbon buildup than this one. I wonder if any coolant got in here in the mix. Let's see if I pull off this head gasket. It is only a two layer steel gasket, not a three layer like some other ones. Kind of disappointing. The ones at the back here are actually much cleaner than the ones in the front. Kind of like how the valve cover was. Taking a look at the bottom end of this engine here, you can see things are pretty dark and that's because the oil has tarnished it. So I'm going to go ahead and remove these pistons so we can examine them a little further. It's a 12.12 millimeter socket. All right, I got my sock here. I just wiped that down. And you see the bearing is actually not worn down too much. It's just one small little line in there and that's it. Now the rest of the connecting rod bearings were pretty much the same. This one's actually the worst one with just one score going through here. So maybe there was some debris passed through the oil system. All right, now I'm gonna try to get the pistons out of here. Hopefully they don't make too much of a mess. 
Oops. Now like most V6 engines, these are spaced about 30 degrees apart or so. And then you have four main bearings. Crankshaft is pretty straightforward. I don't notice any crankshaft damage over here, just some very minor marks that would probably polish out. And this thing spins nice and free. So I'm actually gonna leave this assembly in here because I gotta reassemble this for the core. Now of course looking at the pistons, this is where some of the damage is. You'll see that you got the marks here from where the valves impacted the piston. Now if the cylinder head was much easier to replace and it had like a timing belt or something, you didn't have to do a whole job. Some people would actually just replace the head itself, redo the valve and send the motor along because this is not really catastrophic as long as there's no cracks or anything on it. Now looking at the oil control rings, we know this engine was leaking a lot of oil but it probably wasn't burning too much oil because the oil control rings aren't fully clogged up. I wonder if I'm going to get these rings to compress to get it back in the cylinder. And here we come to the catastrophic damage of this engine and that's all the intake valves here that are stuck open now normally this spring would actually suck this back in just like you have the exhaust valves here and be able to seal this off however because the piston came down and smacked these valves they're actually all bent here and that's why they're stuck open and they can't go back into their valve seat and of course when you have this kind of piston to valve damage you're gonna have to redo the valve seats as well as the valve stem seals and also while you're there you're gonna have to reclean everything make sure that the gasket surfaces are smooth it's pretty much rebuilding this head and at that point you can see why I just swapped in and used engine in this car because it was a lot easier less labor just swap in swap out I didn't have to deal with doing this head needless to say this was the rear head so I'd still have to pull the motor just to get it off you can't even get the catalytic converter off without pulling the motor now I did a little research and I found that there was actually a technical service bulletin and a bit of a safety recall for these bolts backing off because when they do back off obviously it's gonna cause the engine to stall but those only covered the Lexus IS and Lexus GS models and not the ES or Camry or any other front-wheel drive model now this is an early build 2GR so maybe someone forgot to put Loctite on there but it's pretty catastrophic what could happen when just three bolts back off and you just pretty much blow the whole entire motor. Now I've already gone into a lot of detail on the 2GR's lubrication system in my full 2GR teardown video so go check that out but some of the things I didn't like of course is how they run oil through the valve cover to activate the variable valve timing because that can potentially cause another oil leak point and they also run oil past the seals in the timing cover for the oil pump. So I'm gonna see if I can actually kind of put this engine together so I can return it as a core. Look at that oil leak this is crazy probably came from the valve cover or maybe this oil port over here or maybe the timing cover that was sitting back here i don't know got the pistons back together and whoever's rebuilding this engine this is going to leave you a little gem here put a little speed car sticker there for you if it'll stick oh. all right as i'm putting this thing back together i think i'm going to leave a little gem for whoever's rebuilding this engine again and if this engine does make it to a rebuilder make sure you subscribe Kind of therapeutic putting this engine together not caring about anything. Now a lot of people ask me like how do you know where things go when you're putting something back together? The answer is a bunch of bolts and trial and error. Doesn't fit there, seems like it fits there. And then I just run them down. Got the timing all together so this looks like a pretty good spot for a little sticker. When reassembling this core you of course got to leave all the extra parts and the bolts and everything that's left behind for the next guy and then we're going to reinstall that back on there. Now these metal oil filter housings are pretty valuable because the newer ones only come with plastic and they tend to break so it's good to have a spare on hand. So I'm not going to return that with the core. Well I was able to get this engine back together. Now if you do have one of these engines make sure you pay attention on cold starts if that variable valve timing gear is rattling because that could indicate signs of imminent failure very soon. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.